Many people know that Mormons don't use coffee, tea, alcohol, tobacco, but they may not know that practice begins in a document that we call the Word of Wisdom. What can you tell us about the origins of the Word of Wisdom? Well, the Word of Wisdom was born in Newell K. Whitney's store in Kirtland, Ohio, during a meeting of the School of the Prophets. The School of the Prophets was like a missionary prep academy. They were meeting in the winter before they went out in the spring um, on missions. And during one of their meetings, Joseph Smith came out of his translation room and he said, I just received this revelation. And it was the word of wisdom and he read it to them. And they were very enthusiastic. They started making their own copies and disseminating those copies around town. And people immediately started uh, complying. They gave up alcohol, tea, and coffee right away, a lot of them. That enthusiastic compliance wavered with time. <laughs> Kate, you know the famous story about Emma objecting to the tobacco spit and smoke uh, that filled her house, which is, was in the building where they met. But there was a lot more going on beside that to catalyze this revelation. What, what were some of the other things that led to it? In a way, it was God responding both to Emma's individual concern and to the concerns of the broader American culture. They talked a lot about what was good for you and what was bad for you. So this, this revelation didn't come out of a vacuum. Uh, these were questions that were very live. It's surprising to some people to learn from Joseph Smith's history or his journal that he drank occasionally, even after the Word of Wisdom, or that his wife, Emma, took tea, or that Brigham Young took years and years to get over a tobacco habit. What do you say to help people understand those kinds of things? Well, the, the process of identifying what it meant to live the word of wisdom was a long one. Uh, the way we understand it today didn't really become a concrete understanding until 100 years after that revelation was received. Uh, so f for saints around the time of Joseph Smith, they might have thought, well, I won't drink excessively, and that's honoring the word of wisdom. And you have to remember, it says in the revelation, it's to be received as good advice, not as a commandment. And so initially, that's the way people related to it. Kate, it seems to me that the word of wisdom is a really good example of the idea of revelation coming line on line and precept on precept. An example of Elder Bednar's analogy of revelation sometimes being like turning on a light switch and filling the room with light in an instant, and at other times, the gradually rising sun that displaces the darkness over time. What can you say about how the Word of Wisdom functions like that? That's a great way to think about it. We know that people really, they felt they should live it. It wasn't, as the Revelation says, wasn't given as an immediate commandment, but more as good, good advice. Uh, but they still felt that it was important. And they tried, and they failed, and some people tried and succeeded. But it was something they really wrestled with. We know that even in the 1880s, members of the Quorum of the Twelve said, we are recommitting ourselves to live this revelation. We know that Brigham Young himself wasn't able to finally kick tobacco thoroughly until the 1860s. So it's something people took seriously, but they, but they struggled with. So it wasn't really until Heber J. Grant was the prophet and with his prophetic mantle uh, defined for us what it meant to have a minimum compliance of following the word of wisdom in order to be able to go to the temple. He did this in the 1920s and said, you need to abstain from coffee, tea, alcohol, tobacco to attend the temple. And then they still weren't quite getting it. So he did it again in the early 1930s. He said, no, really, this, you <laughs> abstain from this in order to be able to go to the temple. And that's when it really started to take hold. Kate, I think if I had lived in the 19th century, I may well have been addicted or troubled by, by some of those uh, substances. But as it is, I've been taught the Word of Wisdom my whole life, and they haven't been a problem to me. I'm grateful for the Word of Wisdom being given as a forewarning, as it says. And you've got really terrific insights about how it's blessed people as well. Will you share those with us? I see the word of wisdom as a commitment that we make to our community by saying all of us will abstain. We're protecting those who might be likely to become alcoholic. I want the children in my community to grow up in homes where there is no alcoholism, where there is no drug abuse. So by all abstaining, we create a safe space free from that sort of abuse. It's a beautiful way that I feel the Word of Wisdom contributes to the give and take and the sacrifices we make as members of God's community.